thank you very much for those kind words, the very nice introduction. I'm very impressed with the turnout here, and especially on a rainy day. And thanks to the organizers for, uh, for doing this and for uh, asking me and Mary Jenkins, my colleague, to, uh, to speak. Um, so I hope this, the uh, projection system will work. Uh, is the first slide on? Very good. So um, I thought I'd just outline what um, I plan to talk about. First of all, that uh, Parkinson's disease actually affects multiple systems. It isn't just a motor disease or a disease of, of movements, but it affects other, uh, other aspects of the body. And then to um, go into some of the approaches to therapy as, uh, that are newer and I think very promising. Um, and uh, some advances also in understanding the pathophysiology or the mechanism by which Parkinson's occurs. I think new insights have been gained recently about, about the disease, how it starts and progresses. So that gives us a, a handle, hopefully, on being able to, to tackle it in the early phases and prevent it from progressing. So next year will be the 200th anniversary of the famous uh, book that uh, brought Parkinson's disease to attention to the world, although it had been recognized uh, earlier, but never really uh, as well as when James Parkinson uh, described this in his little monograph, a, a small book uh, called the essay, An Essay on the Shaking Palsy. Um, he actually uh, did this from observation. He didn't really lay his hands on the patients uh, to examine them, but he really defined uh, everything you could pretty much learn by observing uh, the, uh, the motor aspects of Parkinson. And he also recognize some of the uh, non-motor uh, things that I'm going to be talking about, such as the problems of swallowing, drooling, and constipation as non-motor uh, aspects of the disease, and he recognized those. So um, I think next year we should try and celebrate him. He was kind of an interesting character. He was a bit of a Renaissance man. He was involved in geology. He was a kind of an activist. Uh, he favored uh, women, allowing women to vote. He was even arrested for his activism at one time. But uh, he, he did this major contribution. That's what he's mostly remembered for. So the next big step after Parkinson's disease was recognized as an entity, and it was really Charcot, a French neurologist who named Parkinson's disease after Parkinson um, in the later 1800s, uh, uh, not until 1960 was it really recognized that uh, a lot of the motor problems or the motor problems were related to low concentrations of dopamine in the brain, a neurotransmitter. And Canada certainly played a role in that discovery. Um, and then the, in 1969, the first trials were done showing the benefits of giving L-dopa or levodopa to patients. So um, I wanted to uh, just recapitulate the major motor manifestations which we use in diagnosing Parkinson's disease, and until recently it was a purely clinical diagnosis. Um, so there's, uh, there is rigidity or resistance to movement. This is one thing that Parkinson himself didn't recognize because he didn't really test the patients directly. Bradykinesia, slow movements, alternating tremor or rest tremor as it's called and postural instability. Um, these uh, uh, manifestations, uh, usually uh, two or more of them, would raise the possibility, a strong possibility, of the person having Parkinsonism anyway. Uh, Parkinsonism refers to these manifestations that can be due to Parkinson disease or some other related diseases or sometimes due to certain drugs or toxins. So the mainstay, anyway, in, in treating uh, Parkinson's disease has been to increase uh, dopamine in the brain or to directly stimulate dopamine receptors with, with what are called dopamine agonists, um, such as Mirapex and Requip. 
Um, so uh, we usually use or start off with levodopa, though, uh, often combined with uh, carbidopa to prevent the breakdown of, or the, meta the further metabolism of uh, levodopa in the body and allowing the levodopa to get into the brain. And we start with that, and that's been sort of the mainstay. But uh, as people have recognized more and more, Parkinson is more than just a motor disease. It's um, a multi-system disorder and affects different systems of uh, both motor and non-motor. And I wanted to emphasize some of those because I think physicians often neglect or don't recognize these. And if they don't bring it up, patients may not bring it up to the doctors. Um, the problem is more than just dopamine deficiency. And it takes a comprehensive evaluation by the doctor to uh, pick up on the non-motor manifestations of the disease. And some of these uh, non-motor manifestations uh, I want to refer to, they're involving the autonomic nervous system, that is the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, psychological effects, um, musculoskeletal or pain especially uh, problems, sleep problems which are very common, and, uh, and even visual disturbances. Now this uh, refers to the autonomic complications. On the left side are the, is the sympathetic nervous system and the right side is the parasympathetic nervous system. These two systems work sort of like a yin-yang kind of combination to control heart rate, uh, gut motility, the bladder function, um, and uh, various other organ functions, and they, they balance each other. So these can go awry when they're imbalanced, and that happens uh, in Parkinson's disease very commonly, especially to the sympathetic system, but also to the parasympathetic system as well. So uh, orthostatic hypotension, or drop in blood pressure when you stand, is very common and affects nearly half of people with Parkinson's disease. And it's multiple different causes for it, um, including the disease itself, uh, both centrally as well as in the, in the ganglia, the uh, peripheral or outer part of the uh, uh, autonomic nervous system. And a drop of more than 20 millimeters of mercury standing up, systolic blood pressure can drop, is considered orthostatic hypotension, or 10 millimeters diastolic drop. If the pressure drops to less than 75 millimeters when you stand, it usually makes the person feel dizzy or lightheaded and can cause fainting even. So it can be a serious uh, problem. Uh, and as I say, maybe multiple things can contribute to it. Uh, supine hypertension or the elevated blood pressure when lying down isn't uncommon either. And that may be just because the person is hypertensive, but uh, it makes the treatment of both these things, which can coexist, rather difficult. And we'll come back a bit to that. Changes uh, in um, uh, cardiac rate and so on can also be a, an issue. Sweating, increased sweating, uh, temperature regulation, um, also because of this imbalance of sympathetic and parasympathetic system. Bladder overactivity, very common, uh, and also, um, sometimes bladder outlet uh, uh, obstruction due to the sphincter not relaxing properly can lead to urinary retention and uh, problems like with urinary infections and so on. Constipation, very common. More than two-thirds of patients uh, have constipation. That usually relates to parasympathetic problems with the gut motility not uh, pushing the, the stool down in the bowel. And also sometimes the failure of the uh, rectal sphincter to relax properly. So it's a kind of a dis, dis synergy, as it's called, or lack of uh, coordinated uh, movement of the bowel. So very common. And as I mentioned, uh, Huntington recognized that early on. So um, how do we deal with the orthostatic hypotension? Um, uh, you can... Um, this is one time when you can increase the salt in the diet. And I've, uh, I was popular with one patient anyway, 
by prescribing potato chips for him to, uh, to take uh, that uh, went over fairly well. So increasing the sodium intake beyond what we, we ordinarily restricted, of course, because it's a risk factor for stroke and so on. But if the person has orthostatic hypotension, you can take some salty broth or have some extra salt to uh, boost the blood volume and help offset the drop in blood pressure. Fluoronef, which is a drug that helps to retain sodium through the kidney, uh, can be helpful. Mitodrine causes vasoconstriction or constriction of the blood vessels, which helps to keep the blood pressure from falling, although it can contribute to supine hypertension or high blood pressure when you're lying down. Um, as I mentioned, or may have mentioned, the drug itself, levodopa, carbidopa, can contribute to orthostatic hypotension. It can cause a drop in blood pressure. So sometimes that has to be adjusted a bit. Perhaps the dose reduced and spread out more through the day. Using stockings, elastic stockings are these ones that are graded in so that um, they keep the blood from pooling in the leg veins. Can be helpful. Abdominal binders, not so much anymore. But I think sleeping on the slope is, is uh, something people do, should use more. It helps both uh, the supine hypertension, because you're not lying flat and getting the maximal blood pressure when you're lying flat, but also it uh, keeps the blood pressure, uh, uh, it helps the, the blood volume to expand when you're sleeping on the slope, and it keeps the blood pressure from falling so much when you're upright. So what I often advise people is to put blocks of uh, wood under the head end of the bed. It's not just the, not raising the head like with pillows, but the whole bed on a slope uh, by four inches up uh, can can help this. And people rarely slide out the other end. So it's usually quite uh, safe to do. And it makes a big difference and can really help people with uh, orthostatic hypotension. We use it in diabetics with autonomic neuropathy and it can be very useful. So, uh, so sleeping on the slope. Um, and again, for supine hypertension, sleeping on the slope helps that. Um, constipation is very common, and there's so many things you can do to try to help that, uh, such as just the ordinary increasing fiber in the diet and fluids. Exercise is helpful. Uh, laxatives and medication adjustment, anti drugs that have uh, effects on the cholinergic system, for instance, like certain tricyclic antidepressants and so on, can aggravate uh, constipation. Uh, so urinary frequency, um, that, that really uh, is often due to the bladder being overactive, and there are some drugs that will help to reduce that, but again, that can have a downside to it too and can increase constipation. So check for the cause of it. Um, it can also be due to outlet obstruction, the sphincter not relaxing properly, and urologists can be very helpful. Ask for a urology consult if this is a big problem. Um, and uh, you can uh, find ways of reducing the, the bladder uh, muscle overactivity or outlet ob obstruction to, uh, to help uh, reduce the urinary frequency, especially at night, which can be very disruptive. And uh, sometimes urgency and continence and so on can uh, be uh, a problem, and you can kind of get around that by um, by some of these measures. And urology urologists are very helpful in this regard. Um, often, the drug tamsulosin or Flumax can be useful too, for especially in when the uh, outlet is not uh, allowing the urine to come out properly. Sweating is a little more difficult to deal with, and it's many people seem to think it's due to the drugs, like the levodopa, I'm not sure, but uh, sometimes adjusting the meds is helpful. We haven't got a very good way of dealing with that. And Dr. Jenkins might have something to add later on. So um, um, there was a Parkinson Quality Improvement Initiative that uh, looked at quality of life in patients with Parkinson's disease, and these are some of the main findings, that uh, depression, uh, is very common, and it is actually part of Parkinson's disease. Not, it doesn't necessarily just result from having Parkinson's disease and, or knowing that, but it can actually develop as part of the disorder. 
And that this can have a major impact on health status and perhaps is as great or greater than the motor problems with Parkinson's disease. And impaired mobility is, is second in this uh, survey. And the results uh, um, vary, depend on different uh, centers, uh, the way that the surveys are done. The um, choice of medications, follow-ups, uh, all these things can, can impact on uh, the quality of life and uh, um, and these, uh, uh, the more special, more therapists you bring in, I think, the better. But uh, I wanted to mention a little bit more about the psychological changes. Depression and anxiety often go hand in hand in the same person, but they can be separate. Uh, cognitive changes, memory, etc., certainly uh, common. Occasionally, psychosis, which can sometimes be drug-related, can happen later on. Um, difficulty concentrating, difficulty with attention or focusing on things. Sometimes this relates to poor sleep, which is very, very common in uh, Parkinson's disease, excessive daytime sleepiness. And impulse control or gambling, which can be sometimes a side effect of some of the dopaminergic agents and um, can be uh, treated by just switching them off those drugs you know, onto levodopa again. So depression, it, as I mentioned, it can arise by itself because there are neurotransmitter imbalances in Parkinson's disease that can uh, contribute to Parkinson uh, to depression, uh, or it can be secondary to um, other factors that co compromise the quality of life, changes of a uh, person's ability to do things, uh, and so on can make uh, can cause depression. And depression isn't always just feeling sad. It there, some symptoms of depression can be just excessive worrying, uh, persistent sadness, excessive crying, loss of interest or anhedonia, loss, loss of enjoyment in things, um, increase in fatigue, loss of energy, feelings of guilt, loss of motivation to do things, and feelings of being a burden to loved ones. All of these can be signs that the person's depressed and uh, can, should bring that to attention, and treatment of depression can sometimes alleviate these. Ruminating about disability and death, also a feature of depression, or can be. So in the management of depression, a holistic approach is really the best way to go. And antidepressants can be used, uh, serotonin, specific ser serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like escitalopram, and so very useful, um, and it's often better to avoid the tricyclic antidepressants because they have anticholinergic effects which can aggravate constipation. So the serotonin reuptake inhibitors are often very useful. Uh, exercise can motivate, improve the feeling of uh, well-being. Psychotherapy, um, uh, behavioral cognitive, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, as well. Um, and uh, helping the person develop uh, coping strategies. Uh, so, um, so all of these measures, I think, uh, you know, and not just one, but can be used in combination, can be very helpful in alleviating uh, depression and Parkinson's disease. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, be wary of some of these symptoms that I mentioned of lack of interest, lack of motivation, and so on, is, could be indi indicative of, Parkin of depression in Parkinson's, and uh, look for treatment. So it's, it's the, probably one of the major problems in, uh, that Parkinson patients deal with. So muscle pain is another common thing. Uh, stiffness and rigidity uh, can be helped by Park anti-Parkinsonian therapy. Dystonia in off periods where there's more sustained contraction of, uh, of muscles, of cramping, uh, as in younger patients especially. And sometimes this can be helped by using Botox in selected cases. Uh, postural changes um, uh, as uh, 
Parkinson described, the stooped posture is, is, uh, was a characteristic thing and can develop as Parkinson's develops or progresses. That is called uh, camptochromia. Also the Pisa syndrome, which is a, more of a lateral bending rather than a forward bending, can also be painful and miserable. Not very common, but it can occur and that can be helped by bracing and physiotherapy. So um, these uh, measures, in addition to, of course, anti-Parkinsonian treatment, which can help all of these. Sometimes patients will develop shoulder pain and tendonitis. They can get frozen shoulder from lack of mobility, uh, lack of movement of the shoulder, exercise and range of motion, and so on, can be helpful. But some patients do develop uh, osteoarthritis and need an orthopedic referral. Sleep disorders, very, very common. Um, I thought it might be interesting just to see, uh, first of all, how many people here have Parkinson disease. Do you mind raising your hand? Okay. Now, how many of you have any problem with sleep? Yeah, probably at least half, more. Um, so it's very common. Um, and there are different causes for it. Um, sleep, uh, sleep disorders are part of uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, sleep apnea, uh, sometimes obstructive sleep apnea can occur, or central sleep apnea where the person isn't breathing as readily. Restless leg syndrome can precede Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, be a symptom before the, Parkinson's, the other features of Parkinson's set in. Uh, and that can be treated fairly readily, uh, often with Mirapex and going to bed. Um, periodic movements in sleep, another type of sleep disorder. REM behavior disorder, which is a kind of acting out your dreams in sleep. Normally the muscles are paralyzed when we dream and we don't uh, move during active dreaming during REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, but people with Parkinson's can sometimes act out their dreams and move or kick or punch, often with the eyes closed. I had one patient who thought he was in a football match and body checked his chest of drawers and hurt his shoulder, uh, acting out his dream. Trouble turning over in bed. Also depression and anxiety make people have trouble falling asleep or if they get up, find it hard to get back to sleep, as can anxiety. Vivid dreams, nightmares, drugs can contribute as well. And of course, frequent urination, I skipped over that. Nocturia, uh, getting up in the night uh, can uh, interfere with sleep, of course. So you sometimes need a sleep study to diagnose what the problem is if you can't sort it out by this, uh, just the history. And that can make a big difference if the person is better rested. So. Um, and better and excessive sleepiness can often be part of Parkinson's as well. And dopamine agonists uh, can sometimes be the cause of that. Uh, and sleep attacks. I should mention that uh, sleep uh, attacks dur during the day can be of two types. There's one in which the person can just fall asleep just without any warning at all. Uh, and that can be dangerous, of course, if driving. And there's another kind in which sleepiness is, in which sleep uh, occurs preceded by drowsiness. And there, there is time, of course, to, you know, so you don't fall asleep at the wheel. But, um, but these are, are fairly common in the day and, um, and uh, one can, uh, uh, and t steps can be taken to try to uh, uh, relieve that to some extent. Visual symptoms are really underemphasized, and I wasn't really aware of this till I kind of looked into for this talk, but uh, blurred vision, double vision occasionally can occur in eye movement problems like slow tracking of, of uh, difficulty tracking uh, a moving object can be uh, a problem, or saccadic eye movements which, in which your eyes can flick from one thing to the other, as in reading. Uh, can sometimes be impaired. And convergence or bringing the eyes together to focus on something near can be impaired as well. It can lead to, there can be difficulty judging distances or shapes. And in some conditions, such as diffuse Lewy body disease, or sometimes drug-induced visual hallucinations 
can occur. Now, there's a long-winded uh, uh, way of exploring this with the uh, unified Parkinson uh, 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 rating scale that uh, um, is very long and tedious and difficult for physicians to administer. So the University of Toronto came up with a non-motor screen that I think could be implemented, although it's not perfect, and it, but it kind of can be used as an initial screen in which you can go through a whole bunch of a checklist of things in a very quick time, or even the patient can do this as a questionnaire before going in to see the doctor. Uh, so it ranges from no drowsiness to worst possible drowsiness, and this, and this scale um, from zero to 10 is commonly used, and it's thought to be fairly accurate, the kind of Likert scale. Uh, nausea, uh, lack of appetite, shortness of breath, depression, anxiety, stiffness, constipation, swallowing, and confusion. All of these are non-motor uh, symptoms that uh, can be screened by this um, little quest brief, very brief questionnaire. And it can be really very helpful. And I think we should, as doctors, use this as at least an initial screen uh, for patients with Parkinson's. So we pick up on these things and not overlook them as we've done in the past. Now I wanted to shift gears just briefly because um, I think there have been some major advances in treatment uh, beyond the pills that uh, we've given and which are, uh, I think, uh, very useful and are the mainstay of treatment, but uh, the, um, a couple of new innovations have really helped, especially patients with more advanced Parkinson's disease where there's a lot of wearing off or uh, development of dyskinesias or involuntary movements. Uh, the duodopa pump, which is a, a pump that is, or at least a catheter, is inserted into part of the small bowel, uh, the jejunum, and um, it's threaded in through the stomach, through a hole in the stomach, and then the pump is outside of the body uh, and can be programmed. And it, it really administers the uh, levodopa in a gel form in a very constant way so there isn't that fluctuation in the blood level of the drug. Um, and that can be very helpful in smoothing out the treatment and uh, lessening the fluctuations that occur through the day and, and so commonly in patients with more advanced Parkinson's disease. Deep brain stimulation I think is a great advance and uh, Dr. Jenkins has much more experience with this than I do but I've certainly seen some excellent testimonials to show its effectiveness and refer to uh, some patients, but um, stimulating the globus pallidus, uh, a deep gray structure, I can't point to this, uh, but, uh, or maybe I can. Um, the uh, inner aspect of the globus pallidus or the subthalamic nucleus um, are two targets that can be stimulated with uh, a an electric, uh, electronic probe, uh, very thin uh, wire that can be put into the brain. And, and this can make a huge difference to people having a lot of problems with wearing off and dyskinesias in advanced Parkinson's disease. So I think this is getting to be more available now and uh, can be uh, very helpful uh, in alleviating some of these fluctuations that we see so commonly, and a lot of the dyskinesias as well. So there are some future endeavors that uh, I think will be perhaps helpful um, and perhaps uh, help in arresting the disease. As I mentioned, the, the um, disease, uh, Parkinson disease has been always just diagnosed by the clinical features, and there may be some biomarkers that may be helpful, uh, the uh, biochemical uh, markers, neuroimaging, looking at the dopamine uh, a transporter, uh, in the brain through special imaging can, uh, can be helpful in making a diagnosis. And uh, certain centers, uh, particularly in the States, are using this now. Genetic testing for hereditary Parkinson's, uh, which is uh, being increasingly recognized. Um, and Parkinson's disease is thought to be due to accumulation of a, dr of a chemical, a protein in the brain called alpha-synuclein. And this is normally present in the brain and it has a use in the brain, but
But when its configuration changes from an alpha helical kind of pattern to beta sheets, or sheets of protein, similar to what happens really in uh, Creutzfeldt disease, uh, which is a prion disease or a transmissible uh, a disorder um, of protein, um, this, can, uh, this can cause the disease to initiate and progress. And it's thought that the accumulation of synuclein can uh, lead to uh, 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 causes the disease, really. And then maybe other mechanisms uh, treating with antioxidants or anti-inflammatories because there is some inflammation that was on. There's probably some degree of uh, um, oxidative damage uh, has been recognized for some time. M maybe that plays a role. And this uh, sort of outlines some of those uh, things with the native alpha-synuclein uh, being changed into these uh, sheets uh, by uh, sometimes genetic causes or sometimes damage by toxins. It's thought perhaps pesticides, for instance, can act as a toxin and cause this co conformation change into a, a beta sheets. And then once that happens, it almost acts like an infectious particle and causes the disease to progress. And it accumulates within nerve cells um, as Lewy bodies and it can be transmitted to uninfected cells from, from cells that have this, uh, these uh, beta sheets that have, uh, can kind of transfect the other, um, uh, other nerve cells. So that's probably what causes the disease to progress. And if we could find a, some way of preventing that from happening, it takes really someone uh, with much more uh, or who is a basic scientist, not myself, to, uh, by any means, to, to tra tackle this thing. But uh, there's certainly active research going on in this. And I think it uh, will hold some promise uh, to help er an early diagnosis and arresting the disease. So I think that is all I had to say. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I don't know if there's time for any questions. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Basically, the same idea. It's uh, leaning to the side. It's a kind of a uh, a dystonic reaction of the muscles in the, along the spine to cause the, the spine to bend laterally. It can be treated by uh, Botox injections that, uh, uh, and pr possibly uh, the, um, you know, just adjusting the drugs. I have, I have one more question, you mind? So for the, uh, you said with the U, UPDRS scale, you yes. showed a U of T abbreviated version? Yes. It, are there studies being done on that, or is that, uh, yeah, how I, does that work? Because I know the UPDRS is quite lengthy. Yeah, it's very lengthy and awkward and difficult to administer. It takes a long time, and most doctors just don't have the time to do it. That's the problem. And uh, yeah, this little scale, I don't think it has been really fully validated, and it's used really just as a screen, and, and so it is a flag to the doctor to zero in on this if the patient indicates that those are issues. Because we forget to ask them, are you depressed or uh, something I always forget to ask, and I think I may have skipped over it, is impulse control and gambling that sometimes can occur. Uh, I may have mentioned very briefly, but it's, uh, it's something that may also be screened with this uh, little tool. I think it can be, you know, very helpful. But it, it isn't truly validated in the same way the, uh, the Parkinson uh, rating scale is. Makes sense. I'm just wondering, uh, Dr. Young, what your thoughts are on complementary therapies? Are you a fan? Um, complementary, complementary therapies? Complementary therapies, yeah. Uh, I think to some extent they can play a role. Certainly, I think exercise, like Tai Chi and some of the uh, these Asian uh, 
things can help in balance and coordination, postural stability. Uh, I think they can be useful. Um, I, as for alternate medications, I wouldn't necessarily recommend uh, any of the... Uh, no trouble with antioxidants, I don't think, if you want to use them. There's some theoretical reason they might help, but it's never been really proven. Uh, but um, some of the other ones I'd be careful and have the pharmacist check to see that they don't interact with the uh, other drugs, I think. Um, I was thinking more along the lines of um, medication and certainly making sure that when you see um, a physician like yourself or your pharmacist that, for example, if you're taking something like St. John's wort, that they know about those kinds of things? Using that as an example? Yes, I, I, um, you know, I don't have any real objection mm. is that they aren't proven and mm. uh, uh, there is a potential for some drugs to interact, so always best to run it by the pharmacist. They're so knowledgeable about these things and they're always pointing it out to me when I order conflicting drugs. Right. So they're great resource people. Well, you're closest. I <laughs> <laughs> um, just want to ask you about the uh, sleeping on a slant. Yes. At the feet up or the head? No, head, head up, feet down on the, on the slope with the, the head up. So how does that help with the low blood pressure? Because I'm thinking, you know, getting the blood up yeah. to the head again. Well, it actually helps. The, the body has a way of uh, adjusting, so your blood pressure is not quite as high when your head is up a bit. So the body will tend to retain sodium and it will uh, expand the blood volume, is my understanding, when you sleep on the slope. Um, and uh, it, can, uh, it can help the blood pressure from falling quite so much when you're upright then. Okay. Because you're sort of partially adapted to a semi-upright, not really upright, but partially upright position. So the idea is to not lie down, not flat anyway. Yes, um, you, you spoke about uh, visual um, symptoms, and I, I just wonder, are there any um, remedies for any of those symptoms available? Sorry, for which sy symptoms? For the visual. Visual sy symptoms, yes. ah. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not very knowledgeable about the visual aspects. I think... Um, Dr. Jenkins is... Yeah, Dr. Jenkins maybe can answer that. Um, so the most common is the um, uh, difficulty converging or reading, trying to bring your eyes in when you're reading. Um, when you look far away, your eyes are slightly pointed out when you read your eyes come in. And so uh, neuro-ophthalmologists can evaluate you and figure out what the change is and can put prisms in your glasses to help adapt. Mm. So if you're having blurred vision or double vision, I would have you see, you know, Dr. Fraser's often um, involved and he's spoken, I think, at a couple of conferences too. Right. So that would be the most common. I would, I would have him evaluate you and look at what the possible causes are. Certainly with anyone, it also can be non-Parkinson's things and so you also want to have an evaluation. But prisms work quite well. And it's a, sorry, prisms are a, a thin layer of glass that you can't see, but it refracts the vision to turn the vision in a bit. Very good. So referral to the ophthalmologist is the, the best thing to do, I guess. Okay. I, yes, I guess there's one more. So would it lose its uh, UPDRS, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, would it lose its validity if people were to use it online? No, I guess it uh, could be done, but I think it's best if it's administered by a physician or someone uh, like Dr. Jenkins who is really uh, very familiar with it and can, can uh, guide the patient through the, the uh, 
different aspects and then do the scoring. It's a very long and rather tedious uh, thing. So, um, uh, but if you want to download it, you can get it off the, off the computer, I think. Yes. What uh, was affected? I believe it was only one symptom at, at the beginning of the uh, uh, when I saw it all. Yes. I, I realized, and, and of course, then you start to look for those symptoms. Right. Yes, it does bring that to mind, and it's uh, it's a good idea. And you could uh, you could download it off the internet. Does uh, Parkinson's really cause breathing problems? And if it does, what can be done to help improve breathing? And breathing. does oxygen um, help with the breathing when you have Parkinson's? I'm s uh, I didn't hear you terribly well. Was it reading you said? Breathing. Breathing, Does sorry. Parkinson's affect yes. breathing? And if so, what can you do about it? I've read a couple articles online and they said, yes, it does. And then you call the specialist and they say, no, it doesn't. Mm. So. Are um, you speaking at, in the night or all, all the time? All the time. Yeah. I'm not too knowledgeable about that either, I'm afraid. And Dr. Jenkins might want to comment on respirations. So, sorry, Dr. Jenkins, one second. We can't hear you. Um, it can cause sleep apnea, which is the um, breathing problem at night, causing snoring, uh, not getting enough oxygen. It doesn't usually cause breathing problems through the day. The only time it can is if your medication's too high and you're getting other wiggling movements that can sometimes affect your breathing. Now, I've had a couple of people who have had breathing issues and we were uh, confused about what they were and we wondered if it was a medication effect and we tried changing the medications. In the end, it actually turned out to be a primary lung problem. The other issue, rather than the Parkinson's, but I think we were worried because they were getting a lot of wiggling movements and was that also affecting the breathing muscles. And then the other thing, because of swallowing issues, people can get lung infections from aspirating from food or fluid going down the wrong way. So that would be where the breathing would come into it, too. This woman's arm's gonna get sore. Does Parkinson's medication cause dystonia? Does it cause dystonia? Um, I don't um, think it uh, causes dystonia. It can um, be, you know... Um, I have both, and I'm wondering whether the Parkinson's medication... Yeah. We use it to relieve dystonia. It's one of the... Uh, there is a levodopa responsive dystonia, but also I think when people have dystonic uh, problems in Parkinson's, it's, it's really the, the disease itself, not the drug, and treating with the drug will often help the dystonia, but I'm not aware that it should cause the dystonia. Okay. Um, Dr. Young, you made reference to a slide that uh, had stiffness and rigidity to anti-Parkinsonian therapy. Can you expand on that? I'm sorry, again, I'm not, not picking up on what you said. There was a slide that said stiffness and rigidity, and then it had a reference to anti-Parkinsonian therapy. I, I, I don't know that phrase. Can you explain that? Yes, well, um, Stiffness and rigidity can be, of course, uh, part of the um, uh, disease. It's uh, uh, the, the rigidity uh, of, um, which is throughout the range of motion. 
uh, is, is integral in, in part of the disorder, along with the slowness of movement. And that's basically what we try to treat in, with the anti-Parkinsonian uh, drugs, the levodopa, carbidopa, and the dopamine agonists, and so on. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, the, and the newer treatments, too, are, are effective uh, in treating that with the duodopa pump and deep brain stimulation. I've often read in some uh, health magazines, various health magazines, traditional and non-traditional, about acupuncture and other uh, methods of treatment for Parkinson. Do you have any opinion on whether the usefulness of any of that? About acupuncture? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't uh, know much about acupuncture, and uh, I, I don't really see the rationale for it, but uh, I don't think it does any harm. I suppose it may relieve some of the pain or discomfort. There's some, uh, some people have uh, used it for that, but again, I'm not uh, knowledgeable about it. Um, so I guess for pain relief, uh, perhaps it might play a role. I wouldn't spend too much money on these alternative treatments, though, that are off the mainstream of Western medicine. But um, I don't really see any uh, downside to it. If you find it helpful, it may be worthwhile. What is the experience with the use of Nupro patch for uh, delivering um, agonists? Is it effective? Yeah, the Nupro patch or Rotigotine patch, I think it's been an advance, all right. Um, it's especially good for restless leg syndrome. Um, and uh, where the, if uh, you find the Mirapex uh, isn't working all that well, the drug we commonly use, the patch can be very useful. I think it's not, so, I used to, I was enthusiastic when it first came out that it might be good for advanced Parkinson's, but it, it has been somewhat disappointing uh, in that respect. I think it can be helpful in giving a more smooth, uh, uh, continuous uh, release of this dopaminergic agent uh, to kind of keep f f the things from fluctuating too much. Uh, but it, um, f in advanced Parkinson's, I think it, um, it isn't that great. Uh, so in mild to moderate Parkinson's, it can play a role, it's uh, useful still expensive, um, and uh, some people have uh, reactions to the, to the adhesive that's used. But um, I think it, it's an advanced but a modest one. I have a question about uh, peripheral nerve involvement in Parkinson's. Um, symptoms like something poking you in the back or a feeling of sand in your shoes. Is that directly related with Parkinson's? Well, I don't think perf that, that sort of peripheral neuropathy is necessarily part of Parkinson's, uh, not to my knowledge anyway. Uh, the autonomic system can certainly be affected, um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to have a p sensory loss or paresthesia or abnormal tingling in the extremities isn't usually part of the picture. So it may be another cause. Uh, for instance, diabetes is a very common cause of that, or, uh, or um, it may be another type of neuropathy. Um, you know, think about nutrition, that sort of thing, vitamins. But, uh, but it, it, to my knowledge, it isn't really part of Parkinson's. Okay, thank you. Uh, Doc, uh, I uh, put Voltaren on my uh, ankle uh, once or twice, sometimes three times a day, to, just to kill the pain. Is this a bad practice, or, or to do it that often? Ankle pain from from uh, the from a uh, uh, muscle contraction? Is that what you're referring well, to? Well, it uh, stiffens right up, turns uh, sideways, yeah. and stiffens right up, and so yeah. you can't walk because it pains too much. So you put that on. Sometimes once a day, sometimes I do it three times a day just so I can keep walking. Yeah. I just that, wondered if that was a bad practice, put it on that much. I, I think that could certainly be uh, 
part of the Parkinsonism, all right, and uh, perhaps a dystonic uh, contraction of the muscles. Um, again, the adjustment of drugs might, might make a difference. He was saying that he was using Voltaren a couple times a day, and was that too much? Yeah. No, uh, that certainly can be uh, helpful, using analgesics. Uh, to uh, Some people have arthritis as well, of course, but uh, I don't see any downside to it if it helps. Great. Any other questions? I think we've exhausted. <laughs>